Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is Embracing Informality to Revive Bargaining and Empower Workers. Now, I'll turn it over to you, Meng, for introductions and to begin our session. Hello, everyone. I am Meng Manatouma, uh, co-founder of Gribouilly, a venture empowering domestic workers in, in France. And I have the great pleasure today to have a, a brilliant uh, panelist for, for a question that is quite important, uh, embracing informality to revive bargaining and empower workers. So this is a question that we see in uh, so many countries uh, that are quite developed or in developing stage. And so to talk about this uh, discussion about labor and about protection of the workers, um, I will just welcome uh, our panelists right now. So Christophe Gauthier is co-founder of Gilder, a French uh, company that is the first worker tech whose goal is to foster social endeavor in business. Uh, and he's doing that by peer-to-peer -peer support. And he will be explaining from uh, his experience in corporate um, field, how we came to this uh, solution and innovative way to revive the labor relations. We have also Martha Chen, uh, which is lecturer in the public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and co-founder of Viego. Uh, Viego is, stands for Women in Informal Employment, Globalization and Organization, and she will be explaining what she's doing for more than a decade to make uh, more light on this informal work. And we also have Fatima Kari, which is a lecturer in the University of Malaya in Malaysia. She's a professor and doctor with a degree at the National University of Malaysia, and she has been working a lot on micro and, micro and micro economics. Um, and she has a, a good background about the development issues uh, in South Asia. And she will be also uh, arguing a lot of what's happening uh, in the cooperatives in the coastal areas of Malaysia, for instance. So this is really a pleasure to have all of you in this panel and to talk about those topics that are very important to me as we face the same issue in domestic work in France and worldwide. So I would like to give um, you directly like um, the opportunity to give us quite a lot of insight. Um, so my first question, my first, uh, the first topic I would like to, to reflect with you is uh, what we think is the definition of labor relations. So very often um, in our society, we think about labor relation as the relation between the employee and the employer, like we have a tandem. And we think that uh, those uh, relations have a lot evolved uh, thanks to um, the advocacy that have been done, but also all the legal environment that has been built. And we think about uh, the workers to be protected today in, in, this, uh, in this century. And so I would like to understand why is it important to still doing some work on this topic on of labor relations what is not already done uh, what are like the main issue that you face uh, today in your profession and maybe the solution that you have been experimenting or studying that can help uh, maybe if um, Christoph wants to start with a context of a very western uh, situation uh, and corporate situation to give us some insight about this question Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I, I will probably represent the old economy, <laughs> the old Western economy. Um, so to answer your question, Mai, um, I would say that all studies prove that when you've got no um, collective bargaining in a company, when you've got no worker representative, um, all so social justice and, and well-being at work is drastically worse than when you've got labor relations. Um, and even now considering uh, the introduction of uh, platform capitalism with Uber and Airbnb and others, um, it's even worse because there are no working relations between uh, the service that is provided by the platform and uh, the workers and in, as a response to this, a lot of um, trade unions or 
regulatory bodies have tried to move back all these workers into some some kind of wage earner um, systems, but it doesn't work either because um, the call for freedom is 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 vivid for these people that often want to have um, they call it um, slash um, uh, a slasher environments because they have multiple jobs at the same time and maybe they're happy with that because they want to have time on and time off so the reason why we need these labor relations is that um, we have something that that needs to be balanced between um, the struggle for growth and um, a, a vivid economy but at the same time some kind of social justice and and it doesn't come from you know magic it's got to come from bargaining uh, it's got to come from understanding the other the the point of view from the other side of the table and apparently for the last 150 years it's easier when you've got people representing and standing up for others uh, in order to um, provide information and then also to be counterparts in negotiations uh, for that matter. But obviously in the current environment, it's got to be something that is not only labor law, it's got to be also adapted to real life uh, and to, you know, grassroots environments where um, there are a lot of changes and and uncertainties for the companies. So this is uh, what we try to do with Gilda. We try to provide the ability for worker representative to chain with, with one another, learn from one another, help one another, because in this very technical um, aspect of collective bargaining, you need to um, have to master legal issues, economic issues, organizational issues, um, um, occupational health and hazard issues uh, related to the workplace. And all this is something that cannot be done uh, very rapidly unless you, you, you get provided some help. Um, helps exist already, but what we try to organize is to leverage that from a country to another, from a company to another, because we consider that sometimes is easier to have some kind of advice um, that has been applied in real life in a real company somewhere else and not necessarily from only a regulation or a theoretical standpoint does that help yeah completely so what i understand is that basically you are coming from a very former uh, work environment and you are bringing uh, some informality by peer-to-peer -peer support to really uh, leverage and revive uh, the, the, these labor relations that are lacking and, and facing issues like uh, the mutation, the quite rapid mutation of, of work environment. And so I, I would like to jump in um, and maybe just give uh, the, the, the mic to, to, to Marta now that is coming from the very informal world and maybe having the different insight and see if it's... Uh, having uh, resonating, echoing with what is uh, what Christoph is saying. Thank you, May, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, and just to say that, of course, all workers want what Christoph was talking about. The question is, what is the nature of work today? And uh, as you said, I come from um, 50 years of activism in the informal with informal workers. And what we know is that informal workers today in this global modern world uh, represent the vast majority of, of workers. Uh, globally, they are 61% of all workers are informal globally. Uh, that's 2 billion workers. Uh, if you move to developing countries, I grew up in India, I think of India as home. It's more than 90% of the workforce is informal, right, in uh, the developing world. And even in the emerging economies, it's 67% of all workers. It's really only in the developed countries where informal workers are a minority. They represent about 18% in developed countries. Now, the definition of informal that is being used um, increasingly 
is that these are workers who do not get social protection through their work. Um, and they also lack legal protections. And what we know is that income from work is a key pathway to reducing poverty, but these workers find it very difficult to work their way out of poverty because they lack the social and uh, legal protections. They also lack a uh, voice in many cases. So the WeGo network that I co-founded 23 years ago now <laughs> um, is dedicated to empowering these workers to secure their livelihoods. And I should note that among informal workers, either two thirds or three quarters, depending on the country, are self-employed, right? So that raises another whole set of issues about labor relations and who's the bargaining partner in collective bargaining. I, but I should also note that globally, 44% of all workers are self-employed. So this requires taking off our current mindset and putting it aside and thinking through what does collective bargaining, what does empowering workers mean for the self-employed. And the bargaining partner often is the state, right? Uh, and indirectly capital, because if they're not, they don't have an employer, um, it's the, the real bargaining partner is often the state. You know, think about urban informal workers and city governments who decide who can do what where in the city. Um, and often they're deciding that they don't want the informal workers because they want a modern world-class city and so they move the informal workers absolutely to the periphery of the city, like they do in formal settlements, but the workers keep coming back because their livelihoods are in the central parts of, of the city. And the question is, uh, where are we going to go? What kind of cities are we going to have? What kind of economies are we gonna have? Will they allow the very micro enterprises to operate alongside um, the larger enterprises. So the WeGo network um, has a three V theory of model of change. And the three Vs are voice, visibility, and validity for the sake of a third V. So we are committed, we're part social movement. So we are committed to strengthening organizations of informal workers so that they are organized and they have collective representative voice in rule setting policy making processes that impact their lives. So we facilitate delegations of workers to the International Labor Conference every year, depending on the topics that are being discussed. That's a, for an example. Um, visibility, we have a dedicated statistics program that works with the UN statistical system and the ILO to improve labor force and other economic statistics. And we would not have had these global estimates that I just shared with you if WeGo had not been there as an informed user of those statistics, continuing to work with the ILO national statistical offices to get those estimates. So those Estimates to us are gold. <laughs> We've worked for 20, two decades to get those, those estimates. And uh, the third V, the validity, it has to do with the legitimacy of these workers. You think about the dominant narrative about the informal economy. What's the dominant narrative? They're illegal, they're criminal, they're underground, they're gray, they're black, they're non-productive, drag on the economy, you hear it. And we want to absolutely turn that narrative on the head because this is the majority of workers. How can you just say all of them are illegal and criminal? Most of them are trying to earn an, an honest living, but the environment is so negative. If you're a street vendor, you face everyday harassment by local authorities and the police every day, bribes, fines, your goods are confiscated, you're evicted periodically, you're beaten. Um, this is 
the reality for them. Uh, and this is why the state becomes such a huge important bargaining counterpart for the informal workers. And one of the things that we have to challenge all the time is the dominant narrative that stigmatizes and penalizes them, right? So we have to change how we think about labor relations and labor statistics and labor. That's sort of more on the positive change, but we also have to reduce all the harm that is done by the dominant narrative that stigmatizes and penalizes the workers. So one little example just coming out of COVID, the thing about COVID in this particular moment, this critical juncture in, you know, existential crisis in the world is that we have more attention paid to informal workers. We know that many health providers are informal, don't have health insurance themselves. And with the, the protests against police violence and economic injustice, the mayor of New York City on June 7th ruled that the enforcement of street vendor regulations and the sort of management of street vendors in New York City will no longer be in the New York Police Department. It'll be moved to another department or another unit will be set up. And um, the Street Vendor Alliance in New York is, is, is thrilled because so many of the street vendors are immigrants, right? We're doing a study of COVID-19, the impact in 12 cities. One of them is in New York. Guess how many languages we had to do the questionnaire? We had to do Arabic, Mandarin, Cantonese, um, Bengali, and Spanish, right? Every other country, it was one, lang one language, right? New York City, it's five different languages. And if they're immigrant street vendors and the police are the enforcers, their lives are miserable and they live with huge amount of stress. So I'll end there, but that is the reality, the, like Christoph said, with the platform economy as well, most of those workers are informal. And, and that's the question of some groups trying to bring them in to give them the employee status so that they can bargain for some of the worker rights. Otherwise they're branded as self-employed, but they don't, they're not really self-employed because they're hugely dependent on the platform for the work, for the price, for the wage, for okay. everything, right? So um, we really have to think completely outside the box about labor, but also about the informal economy. Thank you. Th thank you. I, I, I do think that uh, a lot of things are echoing between the, the two testimonies that you just did because um, what is quite impressive when we talk about uh, self-employed in the context of urbanization, so either um, they are like in uh, developed countries like uh, uh, the Uber drivers or, or things like that, or in uh, developing countries like uh, people sitting in the streets, and, and it's very uh, caricature to say that this way, actually. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, to, to see that they face so many issues while they are belonging to this capitalist actually system. And so they just bring services to the population services that are needed and are asked. And so it's quite interesting actually if, uh, to, to think out of the box and to just uh, come to the scale of the city. And I think the example of New York is quite interesting. Interested. Um, I, I do think that Fatima have also uh, very uh, thoughtful uh, things to share with us in the context of the rural economies. So there also you have so many informal work, informal workers, informal also form of work itself. And uh, maybe if Fatima, uh, you can give us some insight about how in the cooperatives of the coastal area in Malaysia, um, people organize. What does it mean when we are in a cooperative actually to, to think about the labor? And, and I know that they are working a lot in, uh, with the philosophy, with the mindset of communities actually. So maybe the society is not at the scale of a country, but at the scale of a village, of 
uh, profession and so on. So it's quite interesting also to have uh, this insight from you. Thank you very much, my uh, hi, Chris, and uh, hi, Marta. Uh, I'm glad that we have the chance to share quite a number of things here. Yeah? Um, I have seen from your both of your presentation, uh, you are very much into all this. Um, as an economist myself, I, I am very glad the topic on labor has been put up because the basic fundamental of any economic change or economic development in, in any country has always come up from what is the role of labor and also the contribution of labor in any country. Therefore, what I'm saying, what, what at the end of the day, I, I used to teach my students the fact that if you take care of your labor, uh, the development of the country will be very much assured because taking care of the labor means justice, taking care of the labor, uh, especially in terms of their wages, their bargaining rights, the, the way they sort of uh, their freedom and, and also their role in the economy will also mean taking care of poverty as far as the system is concerned, right? Uh, let me share with you some of my own experience. I do work a lot with uh, the, the, what I consider as the grassroots level. I work a lot with the indigenous people. I work a lot with uh, I work, my work focus on the coastal community. Uh, the reason why I focus uh, among this group of people because they are very vulnerable. Uh, like what Marta has said, you know, the employment and the job description among these people is so different. It is just not available in the textbook itself. Therefore, uh, those of us who really want to study their role, uh, their problem, their contribution, we really have to start going down to the field to look at uh, to look at what is their daily life? How do they earn, how do they, uh, earn their living and whatnot? But one thing which is in common uh, uh, as far as the coastal community or the indigenous community is, uh, uh, is concerned, uh, they don't have the protection that what the formal economy has, right? The protection in terms of the wages, the protection in terms of their rights, uh, they are basically left on their own to bargain. Um, what I have done in the past few years was really to make a program to empower them, especially among the women. Uh, I, I, I noticed that uh, if you work among the uh, in, within the community, and then if you are given the chance to work within the woman group, uh, the chance of success is much higher. Uh, I don't mean to uh, be uh, uh, very much uh, on gender here, but it's just my own experience does indicate that if you empower the woman, the success rate will be much, much higher. Uh, I. I experienced that, especially among the uh, coastal community. Now, the coastal community in this part of the world, they are also very vulnerable. One is from climate change. Second is uh, from the fact that the resources that from from the resources that they have uh, they have from the open sea, the ocean, uh, are slowly. Uh, not there anymore, you know, overfishing, the difficulty of getting access to resources. Therefore, many uh, uh, years ago, I embarked on the journey of uh, setting up a community cooperative among the women. Um, we embark on very much what I consider as um, building a heritage economy. To me, the formation of the heritage economy is something to assure the sustainability of the economic system, of the economic system. Especially, I want the economic system to recognize that the skills that the community have, especially among the women, have been recognized. And the market are able to consider it as one of the recognized input as what economists always say, uh, one of an input in the system in which they should be paid accordingly. 
uh, take for example, if the woman in that community can and produce beautiful weaving product, clothing, attire, and whatnot. What I work on is to make sure that the market recognize this as one of the input that will also mean a better livelihood for the community, right? Um, of course, working within the uh, heritage economy is still very new. However, I like the idea of instrument like cooperative, whereby platform like cooperative among the community can give them the bargaining power as far as the market is concerned. But along the way, I do experience the fact that for it to happen in which to empower the community, the entrepreneurial culture among the society must be there. Uh, we are quite lucky in some part of this, in some part of the country, especially in Indonesia, uh, in Thailand, and also in Malaysia, uh, the women folks tend to have that entrepreneurial skills. They can manage their business. They can have they have the skills. They can, they understand the market structure, and they also they understand the uh, customers uh, customers or the consumer. Uh, needs as well. So one thing that I have also learned from what I have done is uh, to work with them to really uh, what I consider as a handheld program, especially among the coastal community, to work on the platform of cooperative. Because a cooperative movement does provide them with the concept of sustainability. But uh, of course, working within the Muslim community uh, is much easier because I can easily blend in concept like cooperative with what we call wakaf. Wakaf is an Islamic concept in which it calls for the community must have the rights over the resources. And wakaf is a concept in, in Islam in which it is assured that resources are being sustainably managed. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, uh, natural resources, you talk about capital, we talk about uh, uh, resources related to finance. It must be managed in such a way that it has to be sustainable. So uh, in fact, Martha did mention the, uh, the concept of collective responsibility. So this too is a way out in terms of how uh, the economy should be designed to empower the community. And only then they can be part of the uh, market system. Otherwise, there will be huge discrimination in the economic system. And that is why poverty persisted over the years in any country because you, you, talk, you are looking at discrimination, you're talking at a, a very uneven platform and a very uneven uh, playground in any society. So I hope that helped, Mai. Yes, completely. And I, I, I do think that uh, in all you said, uh, we can see that first there is a need to think about empowering the, the workers themselves uh, so that they can uh, speak up and, and, and also like uh, be able to, to bargain. And also, uh, secondly, we need uh, a collective uh, conscience, uh, which is like important in formal work as in informal work. And so what I wanted to ask uh, to all of you is really in this new paradigm that is different from the tandem employer-employee that we see that is not really relevant in any of the formal or informal um, and situation, who are the stakeholders that we should consider because if we need a collective um, thinking, a collective engagement, and we see that the market itself also is bringing uh, some response to that, uh, who should we be uh, getting in the conversation? And so uh, maybe, Christophe, you can start um, with, uh, we, we know that in France, we have a, a long history of labor relations, and it's evolving uh, right now, actually, and we have so many stakeholders and uh, I would like to hear from you and from the movements also how they can impact also the labor relations. Yes, sure. Actually, maybe if I 
just rewind one step back. Um, what I think was really um, a connection between what Fatima and Martha were saying with um, the, the previous um, description of, of sort of historical labor relations is resilience. Um, I think we all have in mind the fact that informal work and cooperative with this heritage economy, um, as well as essential workers that uh, certainly appeared um, in the COVID-19 crisis, they all proved that we need to have this kind of balance in order to maintain resilience. And, and it's strange because um, um, it, to a certain extent, and, and capitalism um, has swept resilience to performance. So long-term to short-term. Uh, but what we really want to have is re resilience. And the resilience comes from all these examples you asked me to um, cover. Uh, and the second point is a shift in the image of uh, the worker representatives. So far, they've been annoying uh, and just representing voices of the crowd. And actually, they are progress makers. And, and this is what we need to return to, you know, social progress. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to take advantage of events that take place and, and also stand up and look different from um, uh, the rest of um, people they represent. So in the um, Me Too wave about harassment, uh, that's been a long rising issue until um, 2019, um, we see that in places where worker representatives could suddenly say, hey, this is the right time to talk about that issue and to come up with something that is really um, looking different in terms of um, stopping any kind of um, female aggression, or well, aggression against female uh, workers. Uh, even though labor laws exist, but trying to make sure that you can document something and, and make it applicable. Um, and then suddenly the issue is not necessarily related to going to court because there was some formal harassment, but also any kind of abuse uh, that is informal within the workplace that suddenly shifts in terms of uh, the way you look at it and you don't consider it as being fun anymore or being you know some kind of um, um, things that you can come along and 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 forget about it because uh, it was not said intentionally well certainly it becomes um, something to consider and and to rebalance in order to make sure that the victims uh, don't suffer from it anymore same thing applies with COVID-19 with essential workers and also about telework uh, from, um, you know, the one day to the next, suddenly telework uh, applied to about a third of the working population in, in Europe. Um, previously, companies tend to say that telework is like holidays, uh, you know, trying to, to move away from the workplace to do something that your manager won't see. And, and today, they look at it in a completely different way. And obviously, again, worker representatives need to stand up saying, hey, this is the right moment to do something about it. But how do you uh, involve stakeholders? Well, that's the point of you know, linking with um, activism, uh, with NGOs, actually linking with Martha and linking with Fatima would help. It would help me mm -hmm. um, because uh, from where I stand, I've seen it in, a, in an interesting example. There was an IT company um, originally from India, and they started winning some contracts uh, in Europe. And they would bring Indian uh, engineers to Europe, but with Indian uh, work contracts. And what's funny is that you would tend to consider that obviously their working contracts are less interesting in terms of benefits and compensations than European ones. Um, and to a certain extent, it's true. But at the same time, what they're used to is providing uh, communities, local community support. Uh, they're more uh, eager uh, to 
more assertive in, in um, um, uh, positive discrimination in favor of, fe of female workers because it's a larger issue in India. Uh, so it's funny to see that Indian workers would provide actually uh, inputs and other uh, tools for worker representatives in Europe to do their job better in France. And it was quite an interesting example of uh, having this ability to link in between different uh, way of working and asking and bargaining uh, to make sure that you can go back to this social progress that is the key issue. If we lose social progress and we go back to individual rights, uh, then we, it's, it's not possible to bridge with the other counterpart on the, around the table. Yeah, I, I do think that it's quite interesting that um, you, you bring up actually this idea that we need ecosystems and this is what you are doing with Gilder actually and, and Gilder aim to, to be uh, available in all the countries of, of the world because labor is a topic in all the countries of the world uh, as Fatima said previously. And so we need some ecosystems and so like uh, talking about stakeholders is like a little bit diffuse, but um, uh, it, it's that's why also we need actually workers inside the company to be empowered because they will be the one who will be activating those relations out of the the cell of the the uh, enterprise. Yes. Yes, and they need NGOs to work with them. They need to talk and, and to media's uh, that are specialized in these environments. Um, to link with uh, other consulting firm so that their way of looking at work conditions uh, can be transcribed in new methodology. All these new tools uh, are required now beyond labor laws because labor laws are not enough to protect workers mm. should they be informal or informal environment. Mm. And so it's, it's quite impressive to see that even movements like Me Too uh, are impacting actually the labor relations. And I, I do think that Fatima has a lot of insight about that, about climate change in the same way is also impacting a lot, um, like uh, the, the paradigm inside the cooperatives, their ability to be more or less resilient and working on the coastal area. I, I do think that uh, uh, Fatima, you have a lot to, to share with us about that. Okay, thank you, Mar. Uh Again, uh, I like what Chris has mentioned, uh, protection of workers, whether you talk about formal and informal, is always very weak uh, in terms of the system and in terms of uh, uh, the legal protection of it, right? Uh, before I uh, address to your question, Mai, let, let me just uh, highlight a few facts here. Um, in this part of the world, uh, especially within the formal sectors, what weakened the, the bargaining power of the labor is because you talk about the fragmentation of those who rep represent the workers. Uh, uh, just to share some Malaysian experience. Here in Malaysia, if, if you work in the private sector, you will have many, many organizations right, that represent the labor right. For example, if you're working in the aviation industry, you have one labor union. If you are working in the banking sector, you have one labor union representing you. The same thing if you're working in a public sector, you have different uh, bodies representing different group of workers. You have representative for the teachers association, you have representative from the civil service. Now, on, on the surface, this look good because you have been represented. But if you don't have one strong umbrella body representing your interest, then your bargaining power will be weakened along the way. And this is what happened. Uh, as far as the Malaysian experience is concerned, because the labor representation is very fragmented. Therefore, um, uh, it, it, it wasn't, it, it is not as strong as we want it to be to protect the labor. So if you have a very weak representation within the formal sectors, you would expect worse in the informal sectors as well, right? Of course, problem like climate change, 
is real. Um, I always think that the COVID-19 that we are facing now is the after effect of what we consider as a climate change along the way. Uh, in the literature, it has mentioned one of the one of the problem with climate change will be the emergence of new disease, new pandemic coming our coming the way. And of course, uh, when I'm teaching the same thing to my student, uh, I never could think that I would live long enough to see that this is the problem that we are facing. You know, uh, the emergence of pandemic as a problem with climate change. Uh, again, the problem of climate change in terms of the workers' right is something that no countries have ever uh, been able to sit down to do. What is, what is best to do? what is best to be done in light of the risks associated with climate change. Uh, in my own work, uh, as far as the coastal community and climate change, the, the, the role of labor, I've always looked at it in terms of the poverty problem in this country. Uh, uh, I have always mentioned and emphasis in my work that the labor especially the informal sectors, self-employed, whether that term is right or not, um, whether you, you, you earn or, uh, just the basic minimum wage, whatever they receive, whatever they get out of their service will determine their socioeconomic status. But with climate change along the way, these are the risks that come our way in many forms, it can be in terms of um, poor harvest. It can be in terms of a flood coming coming our way. It can it can be a drought coming our way. It is just the vulnerability of the people uh, within this region, within this area, that is, is our concern. So, at the end of the day, everything we just point out to we are going to see a lot more people who are going below the poverty line, uh, not because they haven't earned enough. What they, have, what they are facing too is the fact that factors like climate change disease has always affect, has always been a risk to them. Therefore, countries like Malaysia or this part of the world are strike, also struggling to propose a basic international income. Right? especially among the workers, to make sure that they are well protected, at least within their basic needs, at least within uh, what they can survive. So therefore, uh, I, would, I would just say that if any country fail to tackle this issue, climate change will always be associated with poverty, extreme poverty, and also extreme Preparation, especially among the vulnerable community. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that's that's all I have, Mike. Yeah, it, it's a lot, and it's so valuable. Hello? And, and um, hello. Yes, can you hear me? So, so we are talking about climate change, are but you actually, there? yeah, currently Did in Malaysia. Yes. Yeah. So in Malaysia right now, there are, there are a lot of floods, and uh, that's why the connection is a little bit unstable with Fatima right now and she doesn't have the video but it's really something that is impacting all of us right now yeah 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 <laughs> so uh, I'm what you said just remind me also that the fact that uh, we activists use a lot the the sustainable development goals from uh, the UN to think about the impact and uh, prepare the future actually and so in what you have been saying like uh, Christophe said that we need to to, to have uh, built some bridges with uh, the NGOs. And you say that uh, governments, all the governments of the world have to, to really take into account all those challenges that we will keep facing actually. And it's unfortunately just the beginning. Um, so it, it's quite, uh, it's quite um, interesting to see that we need to remove all the, the, the barriers between like the institutions, the activists, groups and so on and so on. And so in this regard, I, I would like to hear like Marta about the work that she has been doing because actually Viego is one of those innovative stakeholders that are really making progress in labor relations. And maybe uh, if she has other backgrounds about uh, maybe other kind of stakeholders that we should 
take into account in this discussion. We are happy, happy to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, yes, stakeholders. Well, first and foremost, uh, the key stakeholders are for us the informal workers themselves. And I'm happy to say that there is now a global movement of informal worker organizations. And the part of it that WeGo has been involved in is in four sectors. Uh, one is the one that May works in with domestic workers and home-based producers, street vendors and waste pickers. Uh, those are the four main sectors. Um, we, have, we are primarily urban um, and these are sectors in which you have a lot of women uh, informal workers. Construction and transport are two other big sectors in the urban informal economy, but in most countries it's largely men. So in these four sectors, there are now local, national, regional, and international federations, or local organizations and national, regional, and international federations. So there is an international domestic worker federation there are five or six regional home nets organizations of home-based workers. There's StreetNet International, and there's the Global Alliance of Waste Pickers. And these nets, uh, which we have helped to build and support, um, have between them around 500 affiliate, affiliated organizations in 90 countries, and a total membership uh, above 4 million, going on 5 million um, informal workers. Um, and we know that there are other organizations of informal workers. And the motto of this, the, of this global movement is nothing for us without us. It's a demand that they be involved in all of the discussions, the rule setting, the policy making uh, on rules and regulations and policies and practices that impact their lives. But what we also know and which is built into our structure um, is that we need allies. Uh, the worker groups need allies and they need allies from the research and statistical and academic community. And they need allies from the policymaking practitioner community, if you will. And so we have members in the WeGo network from all th three constituencies. The organizations and the nets have primary place and they're institutional members, but we have individual members from those other two constituencies, the research, statistics, academics, and the policy making practitioner. What we've also found is that any change that we have seen that's positive for these workers comes because of struggle by the workers. There's no city official or policeman or government official who wakes up one morning and says, let's do something to support the informal economy. All of the positive changes, all have come through struggle. And it's a struggle led by the organizations with support from allies. But the second thing we found is um, that if you're an informal worker, um, there are many domains of practice that impact your everyday life and your livelihoods. And all of the SDGs virtually impact your life and livelihoods on a daily basis. But the way policies and practice are structured is that there are these domains, these silos, right? And so that we're having to work across a number of domains to support the workers. So we work on urban. So we have to work with urban planners, the World Urban Forum, UN Habitat, uh, the mayors, you know, UCLG. There are all these organizations in the urban domain, and of course, city governments and all of that. Um, there's and the national urban ministries. Um, there's um, law, and because. There are so many are self-employed. This is not just labor law. This is public law, administrative law, laws of the city, the regulations and ordinances of the city, sector specific laws, commercial laws, bankruptcy, you name it. There are whole domains of law 
that impact on these workers. Um, social protection, by definition, they don't have it. So it's a huge domain of, of practice and policy that needs to be influenced, right? And labor organizing, we need to work, we do work with the trade unions and the ILO and the women's organizations because we always say, especially women, we're not exclusively women in we go. Um, so there's, and I, the, I could go on, there are other domains of practice and, but the other thing we've learned is that the mainstream thinking in each of these domains tends not to have thought through any of what they do through the lens of informal workers, right? So we find this even with the women's organizations. There's a lot of concern about care work, right? In the women's organizations. But for the most part, it's about unpaid care work. And we keep saying, but who's providing the paid care work, right? Most of them are informally employed, right? And who's thinking about their needs for care? So you're a migrant domestic worker stuck in, from the Philippines, stuck in Hong Kong during COVID, and you're worried about the care of your children back home in Philippines during a lockdown when there's no school and no... So to each domain, we bring a heterodox critical lens and say, we have to change the paradigms. All of these paradigms have to shift. And um, you know, there, there's so much talk about the glass ceiling, right? What about the mud floor, the glass floor, whatever you want to call it? Um, from the point of view. So we have to find allies who have a critical position within their disciplines and are willing to shift. Take that critical stance, but then look at it through the lens of informal workers. So mm -hmm. the allies are important, but their mindsets have to be changed, right? Yeah. And it's in multiple domains. And the big one for us, one of the big is the people who set economic policies the economists, because they are literally the priesthood of capitalism. I know it's a, a fancy phrase that is often used, but they are. They're the ones who are helping say that the state shouldn't have a role, that free markets should play out. They're the ones who don't want to impose a wealth tax to deal with public debt, to increase the exchequer. So we always say it's a constrained fiscal space, but it could be much larger. If we taxed Amazon, for God's sake, we could have a huge amount of money coming in. Um, and they're the ones who then say, well, let's tax the informal economy because they're not paying taxes. It, it's obscene. Who's not paying taxes that can easily pay lots of taxes are the big corporates, right? And the poor woman selling tomatoes on the street and they're wilting at the end of the day, how much tax are you going to collect from her? And so fortunately we have economists who we've been able to work with who are writing that most informal workers do not earn enough to be reach the tax threshold, either in corporate tax or individual property tax and informal workers pay what they think are taxes, a range of fees and bribes and rentals, and they pay a lot and get so little back. So we have to work with a whole range, but the target of all of this is state and capital. And I just will end with one of the big problems is that the state and capital collude all the time and create informality at the top of the economic pyramid. The city gives the real estate developer public land to do whatever he thinks is fancy and good for the city. And they bend their rules all the time to allow real estate and other corporates to do what they do, right? They set up special economic zones to attract capital, right? And they then say that any informality at the base where poor people are trying to operate in whatever little space they can find, right? Or just set up their house, that that is bad. And informality at the tip is fine. And that is the root of our rigged system, our systematic injustice 
against the, the working poor. So those are the battles, those are the battle lines. But our allies have to be changed as well along the way in order to be able to change the whole system. I do think that we are in the right place at Radical Exchange to talk about those topics and having all those people, academics, activists, and entrepreneurs, and 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 researchers to to work on on, on that uh, for sure. So we have uh, like the privilege to have a few extra minutes. Um, <laughs> so we already used five, and maybe we we I will ask each of you uh, to give a very short uh, uh, word about what uh, can be the major threat or major opportunity for the future of labor relations. We talk about so many things, um, uh, impact, uh, we talk about governance through cooperatives and so many topics. So each of you, if you can take one, just one topic in the short term and say how it can be a threat or opportunity for the future of labor relations. We want to start. I can start. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to take the COVID moment, the pandemic from lockdowns, right? And, you know, what it has exposed um, are what I call um, the economic fault line and the economic front line. Okay. So we, it has exposed all of these injustices in terms of health access, economics. Who can be a teleworker? You can't be a teleworker if you're a street vendor. You know, it's, very, um, it's exposed all the fault lines in the existing system, but it is also exposed and brought us back to basics, if you will, that what's important on the basic everyday level is food, healthcare, childcare, you know, the basics, right? Fresh air, for God's sake. Mother Nature has enjoyed this moment, right? Um, and it's brought us back to basics and it showed us these frontline essential workers, most of whom, if we had the data, I am sure are informally employed without social or legal protection, right? So then the question is, post COVID or in the new world, are we going back to the old bad normal? Are we going to go to a new worse normal? Or are we going to go to a new better normal for informal workers? So I'm working on a document called From Raw Deal to New Deal. We had the New Deal in the US after the depression. And there's a huge threat at this moment and I'll just give you one example. In the name of public health and in the name of economic recovery, several states of India, and again, I said India is a country I know and love, so I worry about it. Several states in India passed ordinances that banned unions, suspended labor rights, called for a 12 hour workday on the, uh, the corporates were calling and the states supported it, arguing that if you have 12 hour shifts, you have fewer workers each day in the facility and that's good for public health, right? Uh, we know that in Dakar, Senegal, May's country, the city has taken the opportunity of the lockdown to destroy the infrastructure of two historic markets. And we also, Fatima, call those historic street vendor markets heritage economy. We also use that concept, right? Um, so we, we really could be going worse. Fortunately, in India, the trade unions, there are 14 national trade unions, issued an appeal to the ILO about these state ordinances. And the ILO had wrote something to the government of India. And those state ordinances have been rolled back temporarily. I was, you know, they'll find other ways, right? But there are real threats, but I'm enough of an optimist. I'm crazy. I have to be an optimist as well as a pessimist that this is a critical moment and we have to seize it because everyone has seen 
the injustices, everyone has seen that we didn't have balance, that climate change, all of everything was not in balance, and to, to use Christoph's word. And we have to bring a, back a balance and it's back to basics. Um, and, you know, we can forget our fascination with technology and disruption and all of that. We have to come back to basics and say, what kind of balance do we want in our mm. global economic system? Mm, thank you very much, Martha. Christophe, you wanted to jump in as well. Yes, thanks for the floor. Um, actually, the threats that are, obviously I share with what Martha just said, uh, a lot of, we have a lot in common with this uh, one eye optimism and one eye pessimism at the same time. <laughs> Uh, but we're not chameleons, so it doesn't doesn't make a complete picture. It makes something a bit ugly. Um, I would say the two threats are a training gap and location gap. Um, location gap is the fact that collective bargaining works also because um, all stakeholders live in the more or less same neighborhood or territory. Um, we see today in I could call it digital coloni colonialism, uh, that again, there's a split between northern countries where um, all these uh, platform economies um, performing and all these micro labor, uh, micro click um, activities that are, that are not paid properly, uh, often in a lot of informal worker um, uh, workforce. And, uh, and this location gap is part of the problem. So the collective bargaining is also the ability to make sure that this 1% people that Martha was talking about, they can have informality at the top because they are among themselves locally. Uh, and we want to make sure that whenever there, is some, there are some workplaces, um, decisions will take place locally because we know that everyone will abide by them and will be committed to make it, you know, move uh, forward. It's also true in, in this um, city environment that Martha was talking about, mind you, because it, obviously when you can see the benefit of these um, workers at the, at the base, at the bottom, then obviously you have a different view on it when it comes to bargaining. The second gap I was mentioning is training gap. Um, we've seen that it's already difficult to gather people together, uh, but once you've done that, uh, they need to be audible, they need to be heard, and in order to do that, they need to be able to describe what they claim for in such a way that is that can be understood by decision makers. And uh, this is what we try to do at Gilder, saying, you know, people that have some knowledge or um, because they've been, they've gone through the issue that these um, workers want to gain. Um, if they can transmit that knowledge, uh, they, they're able to help them uh, to not only describe um, how to introduce their bargain requests, but also all the shortcomings of how to make it happen uh, when you come to the to the come to negotiation table. We call it social impact itinerary, mm -hmm. social impact route. We know there are different steps and you don't have to, you know, suddenly be depressed because it didn't work the first time. Uh, you've got to keep on going, but you need to know which steps you need to uh, gain at each time because you will be moving and, and getting some traction. Mm -hmm. So this training gap is what we try to bridge by making sure that knowledgeable people and experts can help people out that are less knowledgeable but do have some social um, progress objectives that they want to reach uh, because they have the energy and the other one have the knowledge. And if we combine these two, then maybe we can have the optimistic eye <laughs> to uh, to see that we'll have a, a, a better deal in the future rather than a, a worse deal, as Martha was saying. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Christophe. Um, Fatima, if you would like to, to give us the last insight of this conversation. 
your your mic is is not on. Hmm. Maybe unfortunately we we oh she's she's here. Amazing. Can you Can hear you? me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can yeah, oh, to take a short one. Uh, I think if if the system, capitalist system, still exists on the concept of interest rate, and 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 the the inequality and injustice will will proceed or will exist the way we have seen it. I mean, if the system can get rid of of a, we have can find a way of how to replace. The, the greediness in the system in the form of doing away with interest rate, because that is the real culprit. Then only then the role of labor and the, the role of uh, looking at uh, the justice for labor can be looked into. Uh, it 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 sounds quite impossible, but any system that persists on the on on the principle of interest rate, you will expect it to to be destructive, a self-destructive system. And that's why I'm always in favor of things like social enterprise, uh, social cooperative as a way out in how uh, every one of us, especially on the poor, can, be, can enjoy or can have access uh, to whatever the economy and the system uh, could have. I, I am a great fan of a country must have a very strong social uh, social safety net, right? Uh, country must be daring enough to create the soft safety net for the workers, for the people, to protect the marginalized group, and to make sure that the uh, capitalist system that we have uh, doesn't discriminate, especially among the low income earners. But along the way, at the end of the day, uh, I hope that country all over the world have the political will to change and, and also introduce uh, a system, an economic system, which is fair and just to everybody. That's all I have, Mai. Thank you very much for all your insight. It's, it's really like uh, amazing to have this conversation with the three of you because I, I had the opportunity to talk with each of you and it's really completing like uh, the big picture and, and we see that we need to to reunite those things that we really separated that uh, are like the financial system which is relying on capitalism in our societies and uh, the social justice through protections for workers as well and and also like this innovation part because we see that actually by empowering the workers then we can expect to have innovation we can expect to have uh, very strong and resilient economies that are fitting uh, any situation in this crisis is really showing us that um, 